of, or, and the, the onset of combustion is dictated by injection timing. So we're all very familiar on the left here with the benefits and the drawbacks of conventional diesel combustion. We know that diesel engines have come to dominate all of these heavy duty applications because they have high efficiency and high torque. But they're currently not fuel flexible to go off of anything that doesn't really resemble a diesel molecule. And the largest source of those diesel-like molecules happens to be fossil sources from petroleum. There's also challenges around soot and NOx emissions, which anyone who's worked in the diesel engine space will be very familiar with. Now, on the right hand, we have some fuels that might be more attractive to use. Things like ethanol or methanol or natural gas, things that tend to have smaller molecules that tend to burn more cleanly and make less soot. But normally, these fuels would need to be used in a spark ignited or potentially a homogeneous auto ignited um, combustion device. And that tends to have things like lower efficiency due to lower compression ratio than a diesel, lower torque output, um, and also limitations on things like bore size uh, or challenging controls if you're relying on a premixed auto ignited strategy. And what I want to talk about today is bringing the benefits of mixing controlled combustion process together with clean burning fuels. And the key to doing that is creating a high temperature environment. So what we really needed from the diesel fuel was its behavior, its short ignition delay when it's injected into a diesel engine. And so what we've gone and done is navigated two conditions where we can get that same short ignition delay out of other fuels. Um, so in a diesel engine, you would typically have something like a two millisecond ignition delay. And so by going to a high temperature, we can navigate up to where something like ethanol also has a two millisecond ignition delay. And we can go on and treat it like diesel to get those ignition, the ignition timing, um, and then maintain those desirable benefits of diesel combustion or mixing controlled compression ignition. So I wanted to place this alternative fueled MCCI in the context of some of the other work that's going on. I really like this graphic that I have here in black and white. Um, that's from Eckerly and some of um, his colleagues at Cummins because it shows on the Y axis, the quantity of pre-mixing prior to ignition and on the X, the quantity of alternative fuel. So typically, you know, from diesel, which is non-premixed and non-alternative fuel, you would tend to go in the more premixed direction to get some of these alternative fuels in. You know, things like gasoline compression ignition or um, ethanol HCCI is up here at 100% alternative fuel, but also highly premixed. Um, and the bubble that what I'm talking about today essentially occupies is if you were to just move straight along the X axis to the right without affecting the amount of premixing. Um, so we're using thermal management rather than any kind of stratification to achieve the desired combustion phasing and that desired heat release to match the diesel performance. And one of the other things that um, is important about a non-premixed strategy is that it scales very well up and down with bore size. Um, so if you think of some of the biggest engines in the world, they tend to be diesel, um, or if they're fixed speed, they might be natural gas. But in terms of scaling up and down to the bigger bore sizes, once you get above maybe 130 millimeters, it's challenging to do something like alternative fueled SI, and that's where something like MCCI really shines that at those higher bore sizes, it has no issue scaling. So another aspect of what we've tried to do when we've looked at getting these alternative fuels 
into diesel engine architectures is look at the, the simplest way to adopt this. Um, so like I said, we're using thermal management to create a high temperature environment rather than doing some sort of stratification or change in actually how the engine operates. So we've basically been able to keep pretty much everything about how a diesel engine goes together and make changes at the component level to create this high temperature environment. And what that means is that to deploy something like this in a product, um, it could be going through the same type of assembly process and the same manufacturing capacity that makes engines today could continue to be used. So we're not changing things like the cylinder head or the block, um, but rather, you know, it would be a different piston um, part number, for example, or a different um, fuel injector. And the other reason you'll hear me talk a lot today about fuels like ethanol or methanol is that they're liquids under ambient conditions. And the reason we're focused on them, there's a few reasons, but one is that for the end user who is already used to refueling with a liquid and then getting back on the road or the construction site that's used to trucking the fuel in in a tanker, um, all of that type of logistics can remain the same. Um, just as simple and familiar for the end user. So I mentioned earlier the, the fuel agnostic nature of the high temperature combustion process that we can do. Um, and so that kind of leads you then to say, okay, well, if you're telling me if it's hot enough, anything will burn, what would I want to use? You know, what would my fuel of choice be if that ignition criteria was not a constraint? Um, and one of the things you can look at is the propensity of a fuel to form soot. So these are images that were taken by another student who got his PhD at the same time that I did out at Stanford, looking at um, the luminosity of soot production in different fuels. Um, and so here, these are even at 9x magnification, and you can see they form far less soot. These small molecule oxygenates, like ethanol or methanol or dimethyl ether, than the diesel plume. And that bears out when you do go ahead and do the engine experiment as well, as I'll show you in some of the data later. But one of the things that this affords is the opportunity to do mixing controlled compression ignition or diesel style combustion without a diesel particulate filter. So even if you had to make a more expensive fuel injector to handle a fuel like ethanol or methanol, you would have that already sort of cost trade-off of buffer from getting to eliminate another system component. Um, and so there's some trade-offs on the economics, but it generally comes out in a favorable direction because you can simplify the after treatment by going after these cleaner fuels. So another benefit of not forming soot is that you can actually even operate under a stoichiometric air fuel ratio if you want to. And what that gets you is the ability to use three-way catalysis for NOx after treatment. And the reason that's possible is because you don't actually need excess air to prevent soot production the way a diesel does. Um, and that, that essentially lets you then either use EGR or some other way to displace the incoming air or adjust your air fuel ratio. And then you can have this three-way catalyst after treatment that is an order of magnitude lower cost than the DPF SCR combination we have today, and also an order of magnitude more effective. And I'll get into this a little bit later because it's really interesting, but we've also found that by eliminating this soot constraint, when you're doing engine tuning, um, you don't have the soot NOx trade-off like you normally would for a diesel. And so there are some really interesting things you can do around um, efficiency and NOx when you're not worried about butting up into a soot producing regime. So I'll roughly walk through the changes that would be made to an engine 
to accomplish this type of high temperature mixing controlled combustion. So as I already mentioned, we create the high temperature to enable the ignition of these lower reactivity fuels. And that really is what breaks the diesel engine architecture out from its dependence on cetane number as a fuel attribute. And we do that by either adding coatings or some other form of insulation around the combustion chamber, as well as eliminating the aftercooler on the turbocharger. And that provides enough thermal energy to create the pre-injection temperatures that will let the fuel ignite. Um, so as I've said, we're doing that diesel style mixing controlled compression ignition, and that is what's preserving the high efficiency and the high torque output um, as if it were diesel fuel, just with a different fuel. And if you're able to do that with a fuel that doesn't form soot, you can use exhaust gas to displace intake air and use three-way catalysis for after treatment. So you're also simplifying your emissions. Now, this kind of, I'll, I'll go through this quickly, but the two Venn bubbles that I showed before, there's now a third if you were to add stoichiometric air fuel ratio. Um, and so stepping through, we essentially have the diesel style combustion plus stoichiometric air fuel ratio. If you try to do that with diesel fuel, you would form too much soot. So we need, a, we need to go to a fuel that doesn't produce as much soot. Um, using sootless fuels tends to not work in mixing control compression ignition without high temperatures. And the fuels thus tend to be used in things like spark ignition or HCCI, which can be difficult to control, can have lower efficiency and torque. And so we really come up with the, the uniting of these three things in this high temperature um, capable center intersection. And that's really what enables these mixing controlled stoichiometric and low soot fuels all to come together. Um, and so if you're able to use three-way catalysis, um, you know, this is usually more just for the, um, the effect of showing how complex current diesel after treatment systems are, um, that you can eliminate a lot of the catalysts, a lot of the, the urea dosing system, et cetera. Um, and not only is it saving cost, but it's also, you know, saving on maintenance for the end user. So I know you're probably thinking, or maybe you're not, I would be thinking, how is this different than an adiabatic diesel, which I've heard of before? And what are you gonna do about thermal barrier coatings? Don't they just fall off? Um, so this is different for a few reasons. Um, one, I'll go after the coatings question right off the bat. And that is, we actually don't need as much insulation to achieve the ignition of the fuels as the adiabatic diesel folks tried to use to improve efficiency. Um, so first of all, we can use thinner coatings or less insulation and still achieve the benefit of switching to the fuel. The other thing is that we actually don't mind if a coating wants to hold on to some of the energy and dump it into the next cycle because we're not relying on excess air to prevent soot formation, if our volumetric efficiency is slightly lower, we can still deliver the same amount of fuel and keep the same power. So it doesn't cause a derate the way it would in a diesel engine. Um, and then thirdly, we've also done some work just to avoid coatings altogether, because there are a lot of ways to insulate a combustion chamber. Um, so the piston that's on this slide was one that we made out of a high temperature alloy and we engineered in air pockets to disrupt the heat flux through the structure. And that was actually able to maintain the high temperatures well enough with an all metal design. So we didn't have to even use any ceramics. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work that can be done around just low heat flux piston designs that can enable this type of combustion strategy. Um, I'm gonna skip that. 
I'm going to get into a little bit more of the fuel choice. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, if you could use any fuel, what would you use and why? So one of the things that we found is that there's actually an abundance of decarbonized liquid fuels that already exist. There's a lot of fuels made from biosources or from various renewable pathways and getting them out and getting them into heavy duty applications can allow for faster decarbonization than things like EVs and hydrogen. And this is important because decarbonization this decade has a, has a multiplicative effect. You know, a molecule of CO2 emitted tomorrow would be in the atmosphere for a long time, whereas one emitted at 2045, you know, by that time, this molecule has been at work the whole time. I am not a climate scientist. Um, but the, the point is that we can decarbonize quickly um, and that the volumes of these fuels already exist. The other point I want to mention is that we're not, we're never competing for that same end use application as the EV or as the hydrogen. Um, always complementary, but speed is important. So if you look at the various decarbonized or renewable fuel options that exist today, alcohols tend to offer the best combination of economics and then also just practicality around being a liquid at ambient. Um, so I know, I think we should make as much biodiesel and renewable diesel as we possibly can um, so that that can be used in the absolute toughest applications. Um, those fuels don't tend to have the same types of emissions benefits that the alcohols can if you're able to use them in a heavy duty engine. Um, and the other fuels like hydrogen, methane, ammonia, I think these are all really good and we should also try and scale these up. Um, they're a little bit more challenging to store and a little more challenging to make from a renewable pathway. So we're focused on the alcohols because they have that combination of being a small molecule, already having that oxygen atom on them, which makes it so that they don't tend to form soot, um, and they're also liquids at ambient. They also have significant scale compared to some of the other um, alternatives that we're talking about today. So things like renewable natural gas and renewable diesel are produced in very small volumes compared to the amount of ethanol that we produce. So I've gone ahead and put on here the total non-hydro renewable electricity deployed on the US grid today, um, just for reference. And the amount of ethanol that we produce today is close to the amount of uh, renewable electricity on the grid. Um, and so this is a non-negligible amount of um, decarbonization that we could push. It's on par with what we're talking about with EVs. And as the grid continues to get cleaner, renewable fuels will continue to get cleaner. And so just by combining those two and then driving them both down, we'll have a bigger impact faster. There's also policies that are making it profitable for US producers of ethanol, um, especially in California, to offer steep discounts relative to diesel. So I think today ethanol is something like $1.85 per DG, uh, DGE. Um, and so fleets that would adopt something like this would actually be able to save money in their logistics um, and have more reason than just a um, environmental reason for adopting something. Um, something I didn't know at all before I got into this um, was that there is such a thing as carbon negative alcohol production. Um, and what that means is similar to fuels like renewable natural gas, you can make liquid renewable fuels from waste streams that would otherwise be worse for the environment. Um, so there's things like cellulosic wood waste 
that can be turned into ethanol and then used, and that has a net negative carbon intensity on a life cycle basis. So I even see in the future, if a lot of applications become electrified, there could still be opportunities to use waste streams to liquid fuels to have net carbon negative, um, you know, economically productive activities going around in these heavy duty applications. Um, and this is just two of the um, companies that are working on advanced ethanol technology right now, Amidas and Lonsatec. Um, and I'll, I'll get to it later in the results, but we were able to actually procure a sample of some carbon negative ethanol and put it in the engine that we've retrofit. Now in, in North and South America, ethanol would be the fuel of choice, but in South and East Asia, they are making big moves on fuels like methanol, which also has a number of renewal pathways. Um, and because this is a fuel agnostic high temperature process, um, it can actually work just as well on methanol as ethanol. Um, so now I'll get into the, the meat of the presentation with the, the information about the demonstrations and the data that we've taken. Um, so we've been able to take a 500 horsepower diesel engine platform that would, you know, 15 liters, it would typically be one of the larger engines sold into a semi truck for long haul applications. And we've been able to convert it to run on 100% ethanol fuel. And this was funded by the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, and then also from some of our venture seed funding. So the initial specs of this, it was an EPA certified 2017 engine with a high pressure common rail fuel system. And the changes that we made to it were first modifying the injection system to tolerate alcohol fuels. This tends to be things around sealing materials and elastomers, um, as well as in the long term, doing things to address the lower um, lubricity of a fuel like ethanol compared to a fuel like diesel. We also adjusted thermal management around the combustion chamber. So you can see here the photos. In this case, for our first um, iteration, we did use coatings um, and they did stay on. Um, we're, we're making our metal pistons next. And then we also expanded the ability to do larger amounts of EGR and also uncooled EGR, as I had mentioned earlier, for controlling the air fuel ratio. So the test cell setup, you're doing some initial work down in Columbus, Indiana at an independent test facility called Analytical Engineering Inc. And we set it up in a heavy duty test cell. And initially, because we weren't sure that the stock diesel turbo would be well matched to this alternative fuel process, uh, we actually built a synthetic turbocharging system to provide boost air with a blower and back pressure with a back pressure valve to simulate the port conditions that a turbocharger would impose. We've since put the turbo back on and I have a few initial results from that toward the end. So the first thing that we did was baseline the engine on diesel, uh, which is these blue dotted lines here. We went ahead and mapped out the speed load space and then once we did the conversion to ethanol, we went back so that we could show that we could hit every point in the map. Um, so as I had said, by being able to get these fuels to behave like diesel, we can get the same power and torque. Um, and that is proven out by you know, matching the same BMEP at every speed along the lug line um, and throughout the range. Um, and it's really about matching heat release to match the performance. The second thing we did was see how we were doing on efficiency. So we were able to see equivalent efficiency to the base diesel platform. We hadn't changed the compression ratio 
and um, the insulation counteracted some of the potentially elevated heat transfer losses there could have been from doing a high temperature process. Um, and because we were able to, again, match combustion phasing, match heat release, we were able to see the same efficiency out of the engine. We also looked to be sure that we were actually doing mixing controlled combustion. So we looked at the pressure trace, we looked at the heat release, and we looked at the way that we were able to moderate maximum pressure rise rate um, just by modifying injection timing. So we were able to stay within the limits that we set on pressure rise rate, peak pressure, um, and also able to match combustion phasing. Now, a quick note on injection pressure and timing. One of the things that we found is that we were able to match the efficiency and the power with um, real pressure that was significantly lower than what the diesel system was capable of. Um, so the highest that we did in this 12 mode map was about 1700 bar, whereas on the low end, we were right around you know, 1000, 1200 bar injection pressure. Um, and that's you know still with injection timing within five degrees of TDC, um, right around whatever you would have for the same diesel operating point. Um, but we were able to get away with the lower pressures because we don't tend to form soot. Um, and so it just eases up on that requirement for the high pressure fuel system, which is good because if you're trying to use a fuel that has lower lubricity, but you can back off on that requirement, that makes it much easier to engineer that system. Initially, when we were just focused on, like I said, matching timing, matching heat release, and really having the only thing that we did differently was use a different fuel, we saw roughly equivalent engine out NOx, but virtually zero particulate matter. So on the left, you can see two of the NOx curves um, I think I forgot to say this on an earlier plot, but the hollow symbols are the diesel baseline and the filled in symbols that of the same color are the ethanol at the same operating points. So we saw roughly equivalent NOx, um, but here's the EPA 2010 soot threshold marked on this plot. And here's all 40 points of that 40 point map plotted and they all fell below um, the soot threshold. So even if you were to do a cycle average, you would come out with something that's below the 2010 soot regulation. Um, and that's engine out. There's no particulate filter on here. So if we move beyond just trying to match what the diesel does and not trying to change anything besides the fuel, there are some interesting things we can do. Um, so Essentially, as I alluded to before, you can eliminate this soot NOx trade-off um, that just tends to exist for diesel fuel because it's a long chain hydrocarbon um, and because of the way we use it in a mixing controlled process. So when you use fuels that don't form soot, we were actually able to push far lower on this NOx curve here. Now this is um, a log scale on the x-axis um, and the diesel point was in the orange. So I think this is about three grams per horsepower hour engine out. Um, and we were able to push down by an order of magnitude. Um, and that's really just because we were moving into a regime where the diesel would have just started sooting. Um, but because we were using this fuel, we were able to move further down on the NOx curve. So that has, a number of ramifications for things like an SCR system, whether you would want to downsize it, whether you would want to meet next generation NOx standards like 0.02 with today's SCR technology instead of a more complex multiple SCR or close coupled SCR, um, or um, whether there would be, you know, even in other markets potentially that are less strict right now, you could potentially go without after treatment 
um, and be able to meet some NOx regulations. The other thing that we saw was that across this curve, we had elevated um, exhaust temperatures. Um, so this is turbine in temperature here. But because we were hotter than the diesel all the way along by more than 100 C, um, that would also be better for catalyst conversion efficiency um, and catalyst light off initially. The, the coatings help push more of that enthalpy into the exhaust stream um, and that will help with catalyst light off as well as not having that big particulate filter in the way when you're trying to light off your catalyst initially. You don't have that um, large thermal mass inhibiting things. Um, so a closer look at just plotting the soot and NOx emissions. Now these are both on a log scale. Um, so these were the various data that I showed before with the ultra low soot well below EPA and then also being able to push to low NOx um, before we cross this threshold. And of course the diesel is not on this axis anywhere. It's way higher. Um, finally, we were looking at the elevated exhaust temperatures and looking at the implications for catalysts or, um, or exhaust components. We were worried you know, maybe they're too hot. Um, the temperatures are hotter than diesel, but they're within what you would expect to see from something like a natural gas engine today. Um, and we were even seeing you know, between I guess 25 and 75 degrees C hotter, even down at 25% load. Um, so at the lower and part loads um, where you tend to really need that exhaust enthalpy, um, the insulation is really helping us here. Um, one final sort of systems level benefit is that the diesel particulate filter would normally be a source of back pressure on the engine. So you can get slightly better on brake efficiency without the DPF. Now, as I said earlier, a lot of this data was taken with synthetic turbocharging, but in the last few months, we've gone ahead and put that stock turbo back on uh, because we were able to, to map that we were within its operating band. Um, and so a few observations from running back with the stock turbo are that our efficiency was even slightly better than when we were using the blower setup. And we had low NOx either equivalent or lower than the diesel. And I think um, what this is attributed to is that as we've, as we've been gotten better at tuning the engine for low NOx, and because we don't have that soot constraint, we've been able to navigate to slightly higher efficiencies with keeping low engine out NOx. Um, so I think this is already initial evidence of that improved NOx efficiency trade-off curve that I showed before. Um, so one final result, and, and I know among engineers, among chemists, a molecule of ethanol is a molecule of ethanol wherever it came from, but when I talk about doing a carbon negative heavy duty engine, I don't just mean that theoretically. We actually ran that engine on a sample of carbon negative ethanol um, and it ran just as well as you would expect it to. But you know, the activity of producing that power was a net carbon negative activity. Um, and that's something that we then obviously hope to put into vehicles and all kinds of heavy duty applications that could then use the fuel in the same way. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, we talk a lot about transportation. That's where most of our brains are at, I'm sure. Um, but diesel engines are really everywhere. Um, a lot of them are in stationary applications. And so we've also had some interest in doing demonstrations of a renewable microgrid. Um, today, a lot of the intermittent renewables that get deployed, um, especially in something like a true microgrid, 
um, have some batteries and then also always have a diesel genset. Um, and the purpose of that genset is, is a number of things. It's for something that's fast ramping for backup and also because it is a rotating inertial mass that can maintain high quality power by maintaining that, um, that frequency for the eight alternating current. Um, and what we would be able to do is decouple these wind and solar intermittent assets from the need for a diesel genset by putting any kind of renewable fueled engine with it, um, you know, potentially something using the high temperature MCCI I talked about today, but really anything that's renewably fueled that could complement um, these intermittent assets and allow it to be a fully renewable package that could then go and be deployed. Um, so some of the people we've spoken to about this are utilities who are really excited about this. Um, also places like universities um, and other communities where getting a permit to site a diesel to accompany renewables is actually their biggest challenge in deploying some of these microgrids. And so this would actually ease up some of their pain points. Um, you know, finally, we are looking at putting this engine, um, as I said, we put the turbo back on and we've begun packaging it to put it in a truck. So later this year, we do plan to put it in a class eight truck and have something driving by a year from now. But we're also looking to do demonstrations in other sectors as well. Um, so as I mentioned, gensets, and then also I'm really excited about all the progress that's happening in heavy duty hybrid transmissions right now. I think there's a ton of potential to have a renewably fueled range extender um, with a hybrid transmission that can go in full zero emission mode once it's inside of a city. And there's a couple of reasons I find that really exciting. I think one is that those communities that tend to live along highways might be the last to get recharging infrastructure, but a range extended hybrid that could switch into zero emissions mode that had been charging on the way there could bring the benefits of zero emission ahead of recharging infrastructure. Um, and I think that just has huge um, implications for public health um, and environmental justice. Um, so, with that, I will close and um, they asked me to talk till seven, but I ended five minutes early. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no problem at all, Julie. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we do have a few questions that came in. Uh, so we'll, I think, John, before we go to the breakout rooms, we can field a few of these. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, That's all right. Yeah. First one's uh, from Ken Cinco, who's our uh, treasurer uh, on the board. So, Ken, you should be unmuted. Okay, I am unmuted, I think, and this has nothing to do with my treasurer responsibilities, <laughs> but I, I was noticing back in about slide number 11, where you had a schematic of the power cylinder and the turbocharger and the EGR loop that was letting EGR flow from the exhaust manifold, yeah, on its, of its own volition, I guess, back to the intake manifold. And that would require that the exhaust manifold be at a higher pressure than intake, which from my past experience in diesels is not always the case. Do you have a turbocharger requirement that requires that to be always present with a uh, pressure difference that would drive that EGR back to the intake? Yeah, it's not, it, it'll, it depends on if you want to be lean or stoic. Um, you know, the solution works well, even if you're not displacing all of your intake air. Um, and so there's potential to just, you know, when we've done idle tests, um, there isn't a whole lot of exhaust flowing. Um, and that's, you know, because at those lower loads, there's just not a lot of pressure differential. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's more about um, being able to use exhaust to keep down, it, it really is that, it, additional EGR that I think is keeping our NOx lower. And so I think you would end up in, um, in a space where you would be facing trade-offs and decisions around your, your hardware um, set versus how you wanted to operate it. But there's nothing that would 
you know, prohibit using these fuels or creating the high temperature environment. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ken. Uh, next up, we have Patrick Charbonneau. I think you had a couple of questions, Patrick. Yeah, yes, thank you. Hey, Julie, you did a wonderful job. And any engineer would love to have that Knox particulate trade off or lack of trade off that you've got there. Come but on I do over. Have, I do have two <laughs> questions. Um, one, um, we always run into control system issues. And so one of the questions is um, Has Clear Flame technology? run a multi-cylinder engine on an FTP test yet, a uh, hot and cold transient test. That's my first one. And if you did, what would the results be? And the other thing has to do with the lubricity um, with respect to the diesel fuel system and what additives may be uh, required. Yeah, those are both really good questions. Um, the data I showed today was all steady state data taking it at different points in the operating map. The transients is absolutely the next thing we're gonna be working on. So I hope to have the answer of what the FTP transient looks like within a few months. Um, the lubricity question is a good one. Um, you know, of course, things like fuel lubricated pumps don't work well if your fuel is not a lubricant. Um, so the engine that we converted had an oil lubricated pump already. Um, and so that was really, pretty easy and straightforward to use. Um, when it comes to some of the injector components and some of the clearances, um, there are some different things you can do around uh, material choice, um, surface preparation, and things like that, just to accommodate the other properties of those fuels. Um, it's possible to use lubricity additives as well in a pretty small quantity, um, but that tends to affect fuel logistics and economics. So we're really trying to do the engineering on the systems themselves and let the fuel be the fuel. Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Dan, you're up next. Oh, um, my question, I wrote it down. That's it. So uh, this is, uh, what is, um, I, I didn't just get the essence of this problem, which is how much is uh, uh, the diesel how much does diesel contribute to CO2 emission in general among all other fuels? And what's the extent of this problem that you're trying to solve? I think diesel is 15% of global emissions. I think someone else can jump in and correct me if that's not right. Um, it's, a, okay. it's a significant problem. And I think the other reason to focus on it beyond magnitude is that mm -hmm. these are the most demanding rugged applications that are really hard to electrify. Um, uh -huh. And so I don't want to wait to displace a diesel truck. You know, I don't want to wait until electric gets there. I just want to do it now. Yeah. And um, you talked a lot about high temperature application to burn this, uh, to burn the diesel. Uh, and I'm not a heat guy. Where does all this heat, where do you, how do they get out of the engine in order not to cause a problem? You know? Yeah, so um, it's essentially reducing the amount of heat that's getting um, rejected to the coolant. Um, uh -huh. And a lot of it is going into the exhaust. Um, okay. Some of it is going toward increasing work, um, but a lot of it is also going into the exhaust. Um, so the benefit of it is efficiency by a little bit, and then it's really all about the fuel choice. Um, and then the hot exhaust makes the after treatment happy as well. But you still have to do some work to um, eventually uh, reduce the, uh, or dissipate the heat in that exhaust, you know, because the exhaust is the material choice, you know, we have to change at some point to- Oh, are you asking heat. about yeah. like, are you asking about like the radiator? Right. Um, yeah, so we, because we're, we're doing a high temperature process, but because we're reducing the heat flux into the coolant, the actual uh -huh. heat rejection from the, the coolant loop is uh -huh. about the same, the same or lower than what we've seen on diesel. Okay. Okay, I hope I can understand that, but that's fine. I think you <laughs> answered my question. Thank you, thank, thank you Dan. Uh, Roy Mann, I think you're unmuted if you uh, want to ask a couple of your questions. Yeah, yeah, yes, thank you. 
Julie, that was an excellent presentation. I really uh, got a lot out of it. I have two questions. The first is, what is the thermal efficiency of your uh, engine with ethanol fuel? Yeah, it's the same as whatever the base diesel platform is that we've converted. So typically uh, mid mid 40s, uh, mid to low 40s in efficiency. Um, but you could use all of the same um, sort of additional cards that people are looking at playing for diesel efficiency, you know, things like waste heat recovery, turbo compounding, um, all of these things would apply to this type of setup as well. And in some cases could even derive additional benefit. You know, for okay. example, waste heat recovery system would be thrilled by hot exhaust. So is it the same as the current tier of emission regulations in terms of diesel thermal efficiency then? Yeah. Because you was mentioning a 2010 engine, so I wasn't sure about that. Oh, it was a 2017. Okay. Oh, uh, the, the 2010 was the, the soot um, threshold that I put on that plot. Oh, okay. My second question is, what is the uh, U.S. supply of available ethanol for uh, diesel engines? Yeah, so we make uh, 17 billion gallons of ethanol in the U.S. right now. It's about 10 billion diesel gallon equivalents. Um, right now, there's a little bit of an excess in supply because people have been driving less because of COVID. Um, I think as passenger cars become electrified, that ethanol that's typically used um, as an octane improver and blended into gasoline will need a home. And, and so that'll be available for heavy duty. Um, and also there's a lot of additional um, ethanol production capacity that's sort of standing by. So I think we could fairly easily double production um, without too much strain. And that would get us toward, you know, at least a third of the diesel consumption in the US today. Yeah, that would be close. I don't know, do you know what the current diesel consumption is? Uh, it's like 60 billion gallons. So we have 10 diesel gallon equivalents of ethanol today. Okay, well, it's gone down a little bit since I uh, did some research, so. Um, but it can't take over the full diesel market then, so just part of it, so. <laughs> Not tomorrow, but I hope to, <laughs> my challenge to the ethanol industry is um, they have trouble keeping up with demand. Uh, how much of the ethanol is produced from corn versus um, other sources? Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head the breakdown in the US, um, whether it's corn or cellulosic. I think one of the things that is the most exciting to me is that, you know, the same way that, um, you know, you have RNG, which is a very renewable, low carbon intensity fuel, but your backup is a fossil product in regular natural gas. Um, I think all of the first applications I would want to see this technology in would use that super advanced ethanol, but the backstop, if we have, you know, just an abundance of demand, the backstop and sort of the worst you can do on carbon intensity with corn ethanol is a 45% reduction over diesel. So you're still not all the way back where you were with the fossil product. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roy. Uh, James Simnick, you're up. Yeah, Julian, it's an interesting presentation. Um, you were showing some of the plots where the, the high temperature ethanol engine was providing the same efficiency as diesel fuel, but I'm trying to get my head around the thermodynamics because ethanol has a significantly lower heat of combustion than diesel fuel. So what am I missing? Yeah, so um, what I do, what we do is we inject the same quantity on an energy basis of fuel, not on a volume basis. Um, so you can, oh, okay. I try to match the energy flow rate through the fuel injector. So it's about 1.7x the mass of fuel going in each cycle, and that gives you the same energy. So the volumetric fuel consumption is going to be higher with yeah. the ethanol, of course. Okay, so I didn't miss anything. No, All right. you didn't. <laughs> Thank you, James. Uh, we have one of our students uh, joining us tonight, Antonio Salerno. Do you want to ask your question? Or 
Mari can ask for him. Uh, his question was, is there anything else other than fuel system and pistons that need to be changed? Oh, can you hear me now? Sorry. Am I oh, yep, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I just microphone. stole your thunder. <laughs> I forgot to unmute my mic. But yeah, um, on the hardware side of things, um, are you only changing the pistons to be able to withstand the extra heat? And also, is there anything other than the pistons, the fuel system, and the uh, engine calibration that you have to change? Yeah, I um, I think an added, so we've put a bigger EGR loop on the engine and we've also reduced the amount of cooling. Um, you know, since high temperatures help, we don't actually need to cool the recirculated EGR as much. So there's some modifications to that loop. Um, and other than that, not a whole lot of modifications. Thank you. You'd need, um, you would need basically the equivalent of a diesel engine's cold cold weather package for all conditions to get that initial high temperature slug of air to get the high temperature process going to start with. And David Subert. Whoop, looks like you just went mute again. David's I can't question. wait till we're in person again. <laughs> David's question was, how are the cold start properties of a diesel engine affected by the new fuel? Will additional preheating be required to start the engine? Um, yes. Yeah, so it'll be incredibly similar to, you know, a cold weather package you would have on a diesel today. Um, you know, I have a Dodge Ram truck with a diesel. You turn the key and it tells you to wait. All these grid heaters do their work in the intake. Um, it'll be very similar to that. Technical difficulties here. So I'm with you, Julie, on uh, trying to get back to live. Uh, can I ask a question while you're looking? Sure, sure go ahead. Okay, so you mentioned, first of all, thank you for this really excellent presentation. It was superb. Um, you mentioned a lot about the applications in heavy duty trucks and, um, and stationary engines and things. What about ships? Uh, it would seem to me, I mean, I've, I've been on a couple of cruises with some large ships, but when I've been on actually on a couple of tours of container ships as well. And it seems to me that with Europe now getting more and more stringent with their emissions, um, the U.S. maybe will get exactly that. I'm not sure, but it seems like the application would be reasonably good for ships as well. So I just wondered what your thoughts. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. I know um, some of the the European countries are making moves on doing things like ethanol or methanol. Sorry, methanol with an M mm -hmm. in ferries, either as like a dual fuel with a diesel like pilot ignition. Um, so it sounds it sounds like methanol is getting a fair amount of. Um, I guess, good favor among the marine community. Um, I think it would be cool to see this type of thing, like, you know, an ethanol powered barge going up and down the Mississippi past the Corn Belt, um, you know, ready access to the fuel. Um, but then you would have these criteria pollution benefits um, for the inland waterways. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think it would be a while before we would get after some of those really big low speed two strokes um, <laughs> those are, those are pretty big, but there's no reason you couldn't convert them to something like this. Thank you. And Kelly knew and I, so I think I skipped over you. I apologize. Do you have a question? Yeah. Hey, thank you, Dr. Blumreiter for your presentation <laughs> tonight. Uh, thank you, Kelly. You know, I probably come from a little different uh, perspective than most of the, um, visitors tonight or the, uh, crew here, but uh, being a farmer from Northwest Iowa and also a member of a, or president of the board of an ethanol plant, um, I've been excited about clear flame engines since the day you guys got started a few years ago. But, you know, I, I'm pretty confident in the ethanol industry that we can produce enough to fill the demand. And I guess my question to you is, you know, I, I'm involved in an ethanol plant that's shipped 100% of our ethanol to California for the last several years because we qualify for their low carbon fuel standard. 
And also we're doing several projects to lower our CI scores even further. You know, today we're at 63 CI score and our plan in four years is be at 30 or less. Um, you know, and we also produce some cell cellulosic ethanol at our plant with corn fiber. Um, do you feel that corn-based ethanol can fill the void for clear flame engines or fill the whatever need and, uh, and continue to grow our organizations or our industry? Because be, to be honest with you, we've been restricted in the past by political situations and, and the oil industry and, and feel pretty confident we can fill the need here. So just, just wanted to ask you that question. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for attending, first of all. Um, yeah, I think there's a ton of opportunity, you know, as you know, most of us know, typically ethanol is used in gasoline blending. So it gets sold to the oil companies blended with gasoline, sold to people. Um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity to connect ethanol plants and fleets directly to each other. Um, if the fleets logistics could be powered off of that ethanol product directly, there's a little bit of a disintermediation play you can make um, with the fuel markets. Um, and I also know that you know, for ethanol production, it's one of the lowest hanging fruit for carbon capture um, because it's nearly a pure CO2 stream coming out the stack. And so it's actually quite economical to add carbon capture and something like California's LCFS provides that incentive. Um, I know a number of other states are thinking of following with that same LCFS type structure. And so I hope that also then just provides that economic incentive to drive the carbon intensity of, of ethanol down, whether it's from corn or whether it's from cellulosic or something else. Well. Well, great. Thank you so much, Julie, everybody. We're gonna conclude the formal meeting and we will switch to our breakout rooms here. Um